Hey, Cody. What you doing over there? Hey, Annie. I am answering questions about cloud migrations. Welcome to Hey Track 10. Track 10 is an AWS premier partner with migration competency. We've been around a few migrations and we know our thing or two, so we have your back. Without further ado, let's roll onto some questions. Hey, Track 10. What types of AWS migrations are there? So there's a few different methods to implore when you're looking to migrate to AWS. Uh, the easiest one is called lift and shift model. This is also sometimes called a rehost model. Now what this is super quick is you look at what you have on premise or another system, another cloud, whatever it is, and you're just gonna grab it exactly how it is and push it to the cloud, push it to AWS, exactly how it is. Now this requires the lowest uh, upfront thought, the lowest upfront cost, but keep in mind, since this is not going to be cloud optimized, cloud native or cloud first, anything like that, it will incur a longer, uh, or it will incur more charges across the longer uh, viewpoint of running your application. Now the flip side of that, there is a model called re-architect. Now this is where you will put a lot of thought upfront before you even think about migrating it. What you're gonna do is you're gonna completely rebuild your architecture, your system, application, whatever it is, for the cloud, for AWS specifically. You'll most likely wanna take advantage of all of the cloud native tools, perhaps changes from like a legacy monolithic architecture to something like a microservice architecture, make it event driven, stuff like that. Take advantage of what the cloud really has to offer. Now, like I said, this will require some time up front before you get running up in the cloud. However, you will be taking full advantage of what the cloud has to offer. And by that, your bill in the long view, the long term uh, running of your application will most likely incur fewer charges as, as you look down the line for running your application for as long as possible. Now, if you just wanna get up and running in the cloud super quickly, perhaps you don't want to build something, there are a lot of software as a service platforms out there. There's another path called the repurchase path. Now what this is, is where you just abandon your current tool on your on-premise system, whatever it is, and you buy into a platform that's already built to be cloud native. These are just a few of the uh, popular models to look in, into migrating to the cloud and AWS specifically. Hey, Trick10, how long does a cloud migration take? So long story short, the answer is, it's going to depend on a lot of different factors. But the biggest factor that's going to play into the timeline of your cloud migration is going to be what route you chose for the migration process. Now, if you choose a method, something like a lift and shift or a rehost, uh, this is probably going to be the shortest timeline to being active in the cloud. This is where you're just grabbing exactly whatever you have on premise, pushing up to the cloud. That's typically the shortest timeline is you're not really changing a whole lot. You're just pushing it right up into the cloud. So that could be anywhere from two months to five months, depending on how exactly complex this system is. Now there is possibly a shorter path. That's if you choose the repurchase or replatform option. This would be somewhere like if you decide to ditch your legacy uh, on-premise application to go per, uh, buy into a software as a service model that's already designed to be cloud native. This could be somewhere as short as, again, one month. Just depends on uh, how exactly you're gonna manage your data. Now, if you decide to completely re-architect your, uh, your application, whatever it is, before you push it up into the cloud, this is gonna take a fair bit of time. This could be anywhere from four months onwards. Uh, now, if you decide to work with a good AWS partner, especially one with a migration competency, they can help you out all along the way to ensure this process is as smooth as possible and as quick as possible. Hey, Trick10. How much does a cloud migration cost? So this answer is going to depend on what route you chose for your migration process. There's a few different ways we can look at these costs. I'm thinking of two major uh, facets of cost here. There is the upfront cost just to get into the cloud, the migration process, and then the operational costs. So the cheapest, and or not, maybe not cheapest, but the lowest cost option would be the lift and shift model or rehost, as, as some folks call it. This is where you just grab exactly what you have on premise, push it up into the cloud. This is gonna be the lowest upfront costs, as there's no time for, not a lot of time for re-engineering or, or re-architecting or anything like that. But keep in mind, since you're not taking full advantage of what the cloud has to offer and using cloud native services, you will incur a larger operational cost over time. Now, if you look at the re-architect model or you know, re-platform something along these lines, what you will have is a higher upfront cost for the engineering time required to rebuild, redesign, push everything up there, test it, ensure everything's correct, then shift traffic over, all of that fun stuff. You will incur a higher cost for the actual migration process. But 
Since typically these will be taking advantage of cloud native, cloud first tools, it perhaps will be event driven, all of the cool bells and whistles the cloud has to offer, these will most likely be taking advantage of those. So you will have that higher upfront migration cost. However, the longer, the long-term view for operational costs will be lower as it's built specifically for the cloud. Hey, Truck 10. What are some of the gotchas you see the most when migrating? So there's a couple different things that I commonly see crop up on several different migrations with all sorts of different folks and different life cycles of their businesses. One of the biggest key things is you need to really understand what you want out of the cloud. You need to look at your KPIs, your key performance indicators on your specific application, both on-prem and then decide what you want in the cloud. If you don't understand the key items you want to hit for your application, whether it's something like re uh, response time, common uptime, system availability, things along these lines, if you don't understand exactly what you want out of the cloud, you won't have a good direction on how to decide these hard cut decisions on types of resources, you know, how you want to run your data, stuff like this in the cloud. So if you not understand your, your KPIs, if you go in without even thinking about your KPIs, that may turn this migration into somewhat of a struggle. Now, another item I see a lot uh, that crops up in migrations is not understanding that this change is a paradigm shift for both you, your company, but importantly, your IT team. Now, if you don't communicate this change with your, your IT staff, whether it's a DevOps team, developers, some system engineers, whoever it is, if they aren't aware of these changes and if they aren't brought, uh, brought in these discussions, they aren't made comfortable with these changes, if they aren't shown how to access all of this new architecture, infrastructure, all of this fun stuff, you may get a grinding halt to some of your migrations as you start hitting hiccups with this team. When you start working perhaps with an AWS partner, and we're trying to bring on your team, bring them skilled up and, and get everything up to speed. It can slow things down a little bit. So that's one of the gotchas you really need to keep in mind. Something else that I see that can kind of be like ripping off a Band-Aid is not understanding costs up front. You really need to scope out your application, whatever it is you're going to be bringing into the cloud so you can really grasp what the cost will be so you don't run into a point where out of nowhere, seemingly out of nowhere, costs start ballooning. That can run into issues of budgeting and all of that fun stuff. No one likes a migration that has to stop halfway through because it costs too much and, and that wasn't something that was made aware. Now, if you work with a good AWS partner, especially one with a, uh, a migration competency, they will design with you a future state design document. And in this document, you will see all of your costs for your infrastructure, architecture, whatever it is, before we even start this migration process. So you'll have all this stuff in mind. Thanks for joining us. I'm Cody with Trek 10. This has been Hey Trek 10, where we answer your questions about AWS cloud migrations. If you have other questions, feel free to send them our way at trek10.com forward slash migration.